All right, welcome everyone. Today, myself and Natalie, Tones and team member and album producer, are here talking with the members of the Salon Trio on their recently released album. Salon Trio incorporates Robert DeLutis on the clarinet, Jeffrey Chappell on piano, and Noah Getz on saxophone. Before we jump into the interview, I just want to give out each of them a quick second to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit more about them individually. So, Robert, would you like to go ahead and start? Thanks, Devin. Thanks for having us here today. Uh, we're really excited about this album. And yes, I am currently the professor of clarinet at the University of Maryland. Uh, before coming to Maryland, I was professor of clarinet at Louisiana State University. And before that, uh, I was on the faculty at the Eastman School of Music, where I also played in the Rochester Philharmonic. So uh, in Maryland, I've been here for about 12, uh, no, not 12 years, only eight, eight years so far. And uh, it's been great eight years, made a few albums, and this is our first one for you guys. So we're really excited about that. As are we, as are we. Thank you. Jeffrey, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I've performed throughout the United States, Asia, Latin America, and Europe as a concert pianist. And I'm also a jazz musician and uh, educator and a composer and a journalist and a few other things. So um, uh, I've been on the Goucher College faculty as director of jazz studies for a few decades and uh, also teaching privately and at Levine Music in Washington, DC. Thank you, thank you. And then Noah, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? You bet. Um, absolutely. And, and Devin, uh, again, thank you so much for having us. We're very excited about the release of this recording. Uh, and it's great to be able to talk to you um, for a couple minutes uh, about uh, about ourselves and about the, the group. Um, so uh, I am a uh, musician in residence at American University in Washington, D.C. And uh, I'm a uh, saxophonist, as you mentioned. I play both classical and jazz saxophone and uh, do a lot of uh, contemporary improvisation as well. Um, and so uh, also, uh, much like Jeffrey, I uh, perform uh, both in the States and, and around the world uh, in a variety of different styles and, um, and an educator uh, as well. I have a private studio uh, in addition to my work at American University. Um, yeah. All right. Awesome. So the three of you each have phenomenal careers. I mean, I, uh, Natalie has encountered quite a few of you all throughout her time, just through so many different avenues. Um, so the three of you coming together for the Salon Trio, I, how did that get started? What was that uh, beginning process like? I think we'll, we'll let Noah answer that one since I think Noah was the, uh, was the idea behind all of this. So. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's right. You, you might say it was my fault. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, uh, in, um, in 2017 and 2018, I had uh, received a uh, small grant to create salon concerts in Washington, D.C. in people's homes. Uh, the concept was much like the salons that you might have seen in Paris in an earlier time period or uh, that a lot of other classical composers had uh, worked with over centuries. And I thought it was a wonderful and very intimate way to perform. It was something I always enjoyed when I had the opportunity to do so because I got a chance to talk to the audience and really explain to them what I was doing and they got to ask questions afterwards. So I always loved the idea. And so uh, in the first year of the Salon Concert Series, I just had a few concerts. And then uh, the next year I was funded in order to do a couple more concerts. And that was uh, when I had the funding and opportunity to invite Jeffrey and Robert to, um, to do a Salon concert. Uh, and, and we were able to look at some different repertoire, some of which was uh, clarinet and piano that Robert had been doing uh, that uh, Jeffrey and he were able to collaborate on. And Jeffrey and I had performed some other concerts here and there over time. So we were able to pull in some of that repertoire. And we also had some solo repertoire that we performed as well. So it was a really uh, enjoyable, great evening, great music, music making. And it was something that we just really wanted to 
continue on in some sort of meaningful way. And uh, so we continued after the successful uh, salon that we had, continued to look for opportunities to collaborate and work together, and which we were able to do a number of times. And finally, Robert was able to um, uh, get the grant from the University of Maryland to uh, put this project together. And so this is probably the part of the story where I should hand it over to Robert. Well, I, and I think it was, it was, we were standing in this really beautiful living room at a, was it a brownstone in, in Washington, DC, playing mm -hmm. in these two gentlemen's house, I believe it was. And, you know, part of the salon trio is that these hosts that have us in their homes, they put together these beautiful receptions and they have all their friends over and they set up chairs, some even rent chairs to fill up their place. But uh, it's supposed to be a, a very social event with lots of, uh, you know, mingling with each other and and so I think it was during one of the rehearsals for, for that concert that I, I looked at the guys and I said, we should make a CD. And, and they were like, sure, let's, who's going to pay for it? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think Jeff, Jeffrey had a, a, was, was really interested in the idea too. So well, what were your thoughts on that, Jeffrey, when, when we mentioned that? <laughs> oh, I mean, I love working with you guys and uh, I'm always looking for projects, so it sounded like a great combination. Uh, and we'd already performed a lot of the repertoire, worked extremely well together. So uh, uh, what was the downside? There wasn't any. So let's do it. Yeah, hey, I think we. I think it was right. We Jeffrey and I had just played through the Finzi Five Bagatelles, and we looked at each other and were like, "That was that was nice. Yeah. We should we should record together." And so that was sort of how this all. And then we over come on no you should be in, in on this <laughs> yes <laughs> so but i mean the repertoire we play is not always just a trio that's the thing so it's it's diverse it can be it can be noah alone it could be jeffrey alone it could be all three of us together so that's the fun of playing for people in a concert yeah and to that point i mean we've heard a little bit about how this concept is about the intimate concert setting within houses and kind of like this flexible ensemble repertoire choice. How did you end up deciding what repertoire would be included on that album? Because it's a combination of things, not all trios. I, that's a that's a good question. And I think um, we we tested out a lot of it. I think the last concert we did was sort of a warm up to see if um, if how people would react. And we were at the Robner. Uh, the Robner Industries home, uh, George and uh, Lynn Reeder own that company, and we, they hosted us for an outdoor barbecue, <laughs> and uh, we, I think we tried everything, and, and we got some different reactions at that concert, but we, that was our final test run to see if, if this, this music would be acceptable, because so some of it's pretty out there. Yeah, well, I mean, I remember hearing it, I mean, for context, I studied at the University of Maryland with Robert, um, I did my doctorate there. And so the first time I encountered this lawn trio was through the Riversdale House Mansion concert, which was also a release party. And as you said earlier, also great reception, great <laughs> friends, everybody there. So, you know, really fit in with the theme. And it, it was, a, I think it was a really interesting experience for everybody there and having it in such a, an intimate, an intimate setting. And at least I thought at the time, oh, this would be good, something good for a CD. So it seems to have, to have worked out that way. Yeah, and, and so you know, in in person, no one knows the saxophone can play pretty loud. And so <laughs> I don't know if you go out of your way sometimes to tone it down, but but it always see, no one ever seems to be complaining about the volume. So, but you play a very ge gentle saxophone. So <laughs> yes, that, that, that's right. Um, yeah, it, it's uh, you know it's important uh, what kind of uh, equipment I use to to blend in a setting like this, and it is something I've thought about quite a lot over time. I've played a lot of chamber music where I've needed to um, consider uh, those questions. So it's, uh, yeah, it, it is, um, it's a conscious choice to to be bringing that, that volume down and, and creating that, uh, hopefully that sort of sonic bass, that sort of glue that I think the saxophone can do well when it's, um, when it's at the right dynamic, when the balance is good. Um, so it's something I've thought about a lot. Um, and so the, uh, go ahead, Robert. I, no, I think, and yeah, and I think um, that's one one reaction you get from a lot of people who've heard clarinet and saxophone and piano together is, oh my goodness, the intonation, the balance, it's going to be a nightmare. And 
and that's that's one of the compliments we've already gotten on this CD. Is it's CD? Is it's so in tune? <laughs> and well, and that's that's funny. And we were on the even with the piano tuner at the for the for the event for the recording. It was it was difficult, but well, Jeffrey, this album includes the world premiere recording of your composition after that. And I was wondering if you could tell us more about how that piece came to be brought into the trio setting for this album. When we took this repertoire from this CD uh, into live concerts, I was always a little apprehensive because the music is so modern and uh, dissonant and really kind of challenging for listeners that I wasn't sure what kind of response we were going to get from the audience. And uh, as Natalie, and Robert both have said, uh, we get a great response from the audience. This music is very appealing uh, because of its uh, powerful energy and communicative power. And so that's one reason that I'm so excited about this project. It's actually an arrangement of the slow movement from my solo piano composition called Jazz Sonata which I uh, wrote and premiered back in 2001 at an American Music Festival at the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. And the writing of the piece was very unusual for me because uh, basically I improvised it into existence. And as a composer, I'm used to having a formal plan and having a lot more control over the material and making my composition calculations. But this... Uh, really uh, got dictated to me, essentially. So that's how the piece itself came into being. I call it Aphrodite because it was so beautiful. And also, uh, I play on words, uh, the first two syllables, Afro, uh, pointing to the roots of jazz because uh, it was a jazz sonata and so forth. And the form of the piece is... Uh, typical for jazz as well as the harmonic language but the idea to do it for the trio popped into my mind when uh, Robert and Noah and I were tossing around ideas for repertoire selection and I said well why don't I write something for the album and uh, then the next step was why don't I arrange Aphrodite for the album and so it was uh, it was not a, a far leap to get to that point. translates so well to it as well. Um, so I, it's it, bringing things, I, sometimes I know it can be um, an interesting process to uh, change the setting of a piece, but it, it just, it feels natural. It feels like, you know, this, it was originally written for the trio setting there. So I quite enjoy it. Um, and this is also not the only world premiere recording on the album too. You all have two, um, which is just, Super exciting. Um, and Jessica Crash, we will be uh, releasing a blog post with an interview with her um, later on too. So I hang around for more information on that, everyone. But yeah, it's uh, the repertoire here. It just all works so well. Um, there's variety to it when I listen, but it all also just meshes in a way that it just feels like every piece was meant to be followed by the other in that. So I, I really enjoy the repertoire here. Um, and I fingers crossed that uh, you all continue with these uh, salon series after because I would love to be at one. I want to hear. I want to be there in the audience as well. Absolutely. I, we're not sure if Jeffrey's going to be able to fly all. Of it. Jeffrey's out in California now, right? That's but, right. Um, we're going to we're going to do something um, hopefully at the end of March, maybe outside at the Riverdale Mansion. We're not sure. Uh, it's things that keep getting postponed and postponed, but yeah, we're just waiting for safe travel to happen again. So yeah, Which yeah, could be months. But um, it's funny. Someone else said about the pieces on the CD. They said when they put it, they called me and they said when they put it on, they started smiling when the first piece started, 
and they smiled like the whole CD, which is kind of funny <laughs> that someone would smile during list during the listening. So hey, that's a good that's a good reaction, right? Especially the first piece. Oh yeah, that's that's a high compliment. I know as a performer for you know your performance to make someone smile like that. That absolutely. But kind of feeding into um, you all talking about you know hopefully at the end of March you'll have this outdoor concert. What's next for the Salantria as we start to return to live performances? Um, it's been a year at this point. Um, what are you all hoping to go out and do? Is there a continuation of this series that you all are hoping to do or is it on to uh, new projects? Well, there was something we were going to do. We were going to head to uh, Colombia, South America for the, uh, which international uh, wooden Clary's, Clary, it's called Clary Sax in Medellin, Colombia. And of course that was canceled. Clarinet Fest was canceled. Everything was <laughs> everything was canceled. So I think we're all we've all been just sort of waiting now. But no, what what are the opportunities like in in, in Washington? I mean, I would love to get back in people's homes. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I would say that um, you know, much like everyone else with uh with the pandemic uh, continuing on, we're, you know, slowly uh considering those possibilities you know people are getting vaccinated it's starting to uh um you know starting to feel positive uh, in that way again I, I you know i do think that um you know um i've been doing a lot of commissioning and planning uh, i imagine we all have been and just sort of waiting for that execution phase of uh, of the next step and i think you know speaking to this trio in particular uh, my personal hope is that we are able to continue on with the Salon Trio and we're able to find opportunities and that perhaps um, Jeffrey being on the West Coast is not necessarily uh, purely a downside, but an upside as well. Um, that, you know, perhaps Robert and I can travel out there. And I know Jeffrey has expressed interest in coming back and visiting uh, from time to time. So I, you know, I, I think one of the things that allows the three of us to be um, successful um, in in music in general is our willingness to revisit the things that are that have been done well and finding opportunities for those as well as uh, reaching out for new opportunities. So uh, so the idea that um, that this is something special that we can return to is something that will always be on my mind when I look for opportunities and grant possibilities and things like that. Um, and if something comes up that's not a good for, fit for this, then I'll be looking at that uh, in, in a different way. So it's always that flexibility of keeping the good things in your in the back of your brain and saying, oh, that would be perfect for this group. This would be a perfect opportunity. Let me give Robert a call. Let me give Jeffrey a call on this one. And, and for me, that's how I operate. And I certainly, this is always on the short list. Uh, this trio is always on the short list for me when I'm thinking of opportunities and, and, and ways of reconnecting yeah, and I, was, I mean, thinking about, you know, Jessica's piece, Jeffrey's piece, and maybe even having more pieces commissioned at some point to for this combination. I, I wouldn't say that the repertoire for this combination is that large. I, I mean, yeah, it, it's a struggle sometimes. I think, you know, uh, and, and we really spent a lot of time uh, doing research, uh, finding things that would be a good fit. And, you know, I think it was fascinating to, you know, the Stein uh, was an early adopter piece for us, which I think works really quite well with this trio and, and almost forms that sort of like, um, not first piece ever, but that sort of like earlier, like, you know, er, you know, beginning kind of piece uh, that that opens the concept of, uh, of this kind of writing for others. Uh, what I found when I was looking around for repertoire is that um, one of the things that people have done more as we move, you know, closer to present day is there have been a lot of saxophone and bass clarinet repertoire out there, but not an awful lot of B flat, you know, saxophone and piano repertoire. And, you know, just like any, um, you might call unusual instrumentation, uh, not a lot of composers necessarily know the possibilities. I think the power of a CD like this and the salon concert that we were doing is the aha moment for composers and other performers to say, oh, you know what, this works really well. I didn't realize that this combination could work so well. And I do agree with Robert that I think commissioning new works would be a great avenue for this ensemble moving forward 
both because we know a lot of wonderful composers, but also we can now really demonstrate what the opportunities are for composers when they're considering writing for this combination. And, you know, I think it seems to me that obviously the sonata form with uh, instrumentalist and pianist is obvious to everyone, but the, and a couple people have done clarinet saxophone things, but just to tie that together into a trio format is a step that a lot of people have not taken and one that I think would be very fruitful for composers. Yeah, um, Jessica had never written for this combination. So when I first met with her, she wanted to know what, you know, what type of piece, what type of writing she should do for this kind of trio. And and I had never had a piece written for this combination. So um, we talked about the the blend of the instruments and how the piano can support these things. And, and she was interested in creating um, sort of, non-traditional piano sounds aren't there some things in, that you have to do in her piece jeffrey that are not traditional yeah there's some uh places where you reach inside and and uh, damp the strings and and strike them and so forth and also instructions written into the score such as this should sound like uh uh the bells on an uh an, a cattle cart in india and things like that <laughs> So she had certain sonic uh, things in her imagination that she wanted us to approximate in, in the sounds we were making. Yeah, she, I remember her asking me as well about my background and what kind of music I grew up listening to. And, you know, so you never know where a composer is going to take it. Jeffrey, you were just inspired by your piece that you wrote. Is that right? Yeah, pretty yes. much. Yeah. So Jessica did, I think she, she'll talk to you more in your interview, but she, um, I think she had just returned from India. So I'm sure that will be an interesting uh, take on, on how she came up with her piece as well. And to Noah's point about, uh, you know, the, the blend of the instruments, that was actually one of the selling points, I think, that got us the grant from the University of Maryland was, was that this combination was creating basically a, a sound that's not that heard and but that explained right in in the relationship between the clarinet and the saxophone and how the saxophone basically grew out of the clarinet and the invention of the instrument was heavily based on the clarinet i mean adolf sax he was he clearly could probably play, he could play the clarinet in order to invent the saxophone oh yes uh yeah he he went to the uh uh, Royal Conservatory of Brussels uh, uh, as a clarinetist uh, prior to inventing the saxophone. So yes, he was uh, well versed in the clarinet, um, and and the clarinet in or the saxophone in terms of invention really in some ways is a hybrid of the technology and the sonic uh, ideas of the clarinet mixed with the at that time the modern flute keyed mechanism. Uh, so it's it's living in in those kind of realms. Um, uh, that that sax invented his instrument, but yes, a lot of knowledge of of clarinet playing for sure. Yeah, I, w I wanted to mention uh, David's piece. You know, I think some some of this repertoire grew out of personal relationships, not necessarily the the stuff that was pre existing grew out of other relationships with other fine saxophonists and clarinetists. And so I know for David, uh, his faculty members at the time uh, when he had written, he's a pianist and composer, and he had written for people that he knew, I think some of these other pieces sort of grew out of that kind of personal relationship where a composer would not have necessarily automatically said, I want to write a piece for piano, saxophone, and clarinet, but instead said, I've got these two friends, they're fantastic players, could I do something with this? And uh, some of this is an outgrowth of that kind of um, collaborative idea. Uh, Wanamaker is also a uh, a faculty member at the Crane School of Music. And so David and Gregory Wanamaker both were writing for clarinet and saxophone out of the same kind of ideas of, I have a lot of respect for these players. They're friends of mine. We are faculty members together. And so uh, that's a fascinating um, sort of, I guess, hotbed of clarinet and saxophone playing <laughs> or something like that. Um, but it's, it's fascinating to realize the two of these composers were on the same faculty 
and kind of had the same idea. Maybe they were talking together in the, uh, you know, over the water cooler about this um, mm -hmm. and inspired each other. But it's nice to, um, you know, I think those are two really strong pieces that grew out of that. Jessica um, contacted me through the university. She called me to perform on a, on a concert she was playing, uh, for putting on of her music and it, uh, a new CD came out of that concert as well. And so um, we became friends just from that project. And then when this came up, I thought she'd be the first, the first person to ask to write a piece for this trio. So there's always some connection somewhere. It doesn't usually come out of the blue. You don't just usually pick up the phone and call a composer. Yeah, uh, on the performer side of things, you know, we, we all know that oftentimes the best commissions collaborations are those that came from friendships or just meeting at a conference and that relationship was built that way. And it, it's, it's fun to think that it, all, it comes full circle too with the idea of the Salon Trio of having those personal intimate connections in a home setting. On the composer side, it's like having them in your compositional world home. <laughs> You know, and, and, and knowing somebody beyond just, just a name at the bottom of an email interaction, knowing they're playing, knowing something about their personality, where they've traveled, what they've listened to as a child, that um, can lead to some really interesting creative output. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I will say, um, especially with uh, just listening to Jessica's piece and hearing from you too, just uh, what that process of talking about the commission was like. I mean, it's, you can hear that kind of care in a composition. Um, it's obvious in the playing of you three in general that you all are great friends, that you communicate well musically and verbally. But even in Jessica's, I was, I was just struck by that kind of feeling of almost like intimacy of just like you're pulled into that relationship that that piece was born out of. So I think that's, that's great. And it seems like the common thread of the ensemble as a whole, this started off because of three great friendships and it's continued by bringing that music into the homes of people, like Natalie said. So I think that's just a really special um, thread, common thing this ensemble has. Um, and I think it comes across beautifully in the playing in the album as well. I like that aspect of the salon concerts, because if you're up on a stage that, in a hall that seats 500 or 1,000 people, you know, you look out there in the dark and, and uh, you, you hope they're all there and that you're reaching them. But in that intimate setting, you can really see how people are moved and touched by the music that you're playing and get that really instant feedback on making that kind of important connection that you hope to make through the music. I don't remember if this happened in our, our particular trio concert or not, but during the course of some of these salon concerts that I had, we, of course, always offer the possibility for audience members to ask questions, to speak up, that kind of thing. And there have been a few occasions where someone was so excited or anxious about what they were thinking about that they would ask in between pieces, that they wouldn't wait until the end. And so <laughs> the hands would be raised and say, you know, Robert, I really have this question about that piece or, or whatever. I, I don't remember if that happened. Yeah, it did. It did. And, and we're not done yet. So can you hold on to that? <laughs> no, it's pretty informal. So we, we answer, you know, you're in somebody's home. What are you going to do? They could throw you out. <laughs> <laughs> and like you said, the spread that they had there, you, you didn't want to get thrown out before you had an opportunity to uh, <laughs> enjoy the wonderful food that they had prepared. That's right. I think, um, yeah, it's a, it is, it is a great experience. I mean, I've played for people in their homes before alone. And I think it's a little intimidating for some people when they think of having a concert in their home and how unusual that is. But I've been asked now since people know this album, I've been asked several times by people when this is over to, to come to their home, either to play in their backyard or to play in their home. And, and generally, if they have a piano, we can do it. I mean, we we played in a house I remember in D.C. that was so small. People were sitting basically on top of us on the steps. They were sitting everywhere in mm -hmm. rooms they couldn't see us. Some before in the kitchen. It was it was it's pretty chaotic if it's a small home, but you make it happen. Yeah, very comfy. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I, uh, Robert, when you mentioned that feedback that you, that the person smiled uh, from the beginning to the end of the album, listening to it, it made me think that 
you know, I think that that is kind of the common experience that the, the three of us sort of have when we're playing together is that we have a real joy for playing together. And, and perhaps that has translated into this recording, that sense of a smile uh, in, in the music, in the in-betweens. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, I definitely agree. You can, you can hear it in the music for sure, absolutely. Well, thank you all so much from myself, Natalie, the Tones Ahead team for taking the time to talk to us and give us a little bit more insight about the album. I, I think this is an extremely special album. Um, I know people have already been enjoying it and I, I sincerely hope that more people get the opportunity to hear the amazing performances you all have put on, hear these pieces and experience a little bit of the Salon Trio in their homes, despite, you know, maybe not being able to have in-person performances at the moment. So thank you, Robert, Jeffrey and Noah for your time. And we look forward to hearing more from the Salon Trio in the future. Mm -hmm.